Hello, everyone, to the Society for Armenian Studies new series called uh, TDUG. Uh, TDUG is, uh, is called the Society for Armenian Studies Graduate Student Colloquium, uh, uh, which will present the latest works by our graduate students or any other graduate student who is working on themes and topics pertaining to Armenian studies in the general understanding. Uh, Varak Ketsemanyan, our uh, presenter today, came up with this idea. Varak is a member of the Executive Council of the Society for Armenian Studies. He came up with this idea of creating this uh, series in which uh, graduate students would present their latest work and have a discussion in order to enlighten us with the latest uh, historiographic theoretical approaches in the field of Armenian studies in its general understanding. The new generation has been really doing great job, I think, in presenting new approaches to understand understanding uh, the field of Armenian studies. And we see uh, there is a lot of concentration on Ottoman Armenian history, not only concentrating on the Armenian genocide, which has been the, the pattern until the last or two decades, but now we have a new approach of understanding the contribution of Armenians and the role of Armenians in the 19th century. Uh, Vara Ketsemanian is a PhD candidate in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Princeton University. He's an adjunct lecturer at the American University of Armenia teaching courses on Middle Eastern history. He is writing a fantastic dissertation about the, uh, about the Armenian constitutional movement in the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we are all looking forward to read his dissertation, which will, which will be done very soon. He's defending it this month, as far as I know. Uh, his articles have appeared in prominent journals, such as the, uh, the journal, International Journal of the Middle East Studies and the Journal of the Ottoman and Turkish Studies. He is uh, fluent in multiple languages, Arabic, Ottoman, Turkish, Armenian, French, uh, among others. He's the author, uh, he's the co-editor of a book with Emra John Daolu from Stanford University. He is a graduate student called Memoirs of Boros Shadik between 1874, 1951, a revolutionary from Baku to Marseille, which is forthcoming with the Armenian Studies Series at Michigan State University. Uh, welcome, Barak, and thanks for launching this new uh, news lecture series called TDAC, the Society for Armenian Studies graduate student colloquium. If anyone wants to present in this colloquium, please contact Barak and CC Katarina Terzian, our uh, executive secretary. Floor is yours, Barak. Thank you. Thank you, Bedros, for the generous introduction. Let me just share my screen because I do have a PowerPoint. And uh, can you all see my screen? Hello. Yeah, Varak, just go to the slideshow and enlarge the screen. Yeah. Go to slideshow. Oh. Yeah, just wanted to make sure that everyone sees it. Okay, so I'll try to be brief as much as possible, and then we can have a Q&A session. So today, what I'll be talking is Ottoman Armenian constitutionalism in the late 19th, early 20th century towards social histories. And it's part of a larger project that I'm working on as part of my dissertation and hopefully as part of my my book in the future. So I'm trying to suggest a general framework for understanding late Ottoman Armenian social and political history or, or, uh, or mass politics, social politics in general. Before, before we go into the Ottoman case, we actually have to bear in mind that constitutionalism as a movement had a global impact in the 1850s and the 1860s. So before actually we look at, we, we look at the Ottoman case, we have to bear in mind that constitutionalism or constitutions were seen as markers of modernity and enlightenment, especially in Europe at the time in the 1850s and 60s. And below you have some examples of states or countries that adopted constitutions at, in that very specific uh, time period, such as France, Argentina, Spain, Greece, uh, and Austria-Hungary. 
Of course, the Ottoman Empire was no exception to this, to this global movement. And for those of you who are familiar with late Ottoman history, we know that the Ottoman authorities launched the uh, reforms, social, military, economic, and political reforms that are called or were referred to as the Tanzimat reforms in the early 19th century. And the, the, the impetus behind the, the Tanzimat reforms was to have a more centralized, systematized, and institutionalized administration, imperial administration, and uh, uh, by, let's say, uh, by uh, default, also communal administration, which I will talk more about in today's lecture. So when we look at the Ottoman experience, we see the case of Mount Lebanon and Tunisia, both kind of geographic regions in the empire, gaining some form of constitutions or regulations in 1860, 1861. And for our purposes here today, Armenian, Greek, and Jewish communities, religious communities referred to as millet, they gained or received their Nizam Names or communal constitutions in the early 1860s as well. So my, my focus today would be on the Armenian National Constitution, which was uh, first drafted in 1857. And the, although there were different drafting sessions, which I will not go into the details, it was ratified in 1860, but it was revised and finalized in 1863. So in 1863, the, the imperial authorities, Ottoman imperial authorities ratified the Armenian National Constitution. And it's really important to actually look at the Armenian experience in the 1860s as part of this larger imperial and regional context of constitutional movement. So Armenians were not isolated communities or subject, but they were actually interacting or engaging with different constitutional currents and uh, intellectual uh, movements. So this is a, a picture or a photo of the Armenian National Constitution called Askain Salman Tuchun Hayots in Armenian, which still, which still kind of operates in the Armenian diaspora and the communities of the Armenian diaspora, but that's something we can discuss later. So when I first started this research, uh, the main, let's say, research question that I had in my mind was, how was the constitution implemented in Constantinople and in the provinces? So this was basically a, a very simple question of understanding how this constitution worked for the Armenian community. And as I went through the literature, the sources, the materials, different sub-questions actually emerged, such as what did constitutional mean for provincial Armenians and how did they adapt to the changes? How did the Ottoman provinces experience the Armenian constitution? Who were its practitioners? And how did it affect society? And finally, what were some of the problems that the Armenians were addressing through this constitutional system? So the, these are some of the questions that I tried to grapple with in my dissertation. Before we actually respond or try to give an answer to these questions, it's important to have or to give an overview of Armenian constitutional movement as such. So from 1847 until 1863, a time peri period that is relatively well covered in the literature and the historiography and what we can refer to as the proto-constitutional phase was when two councils, the religious council and the civic council, Kaka Ganjov and the Grona Ganjov in Armenian, were established under the auspices of the patriarch or under the auspices of the patriarchate in 1847. In 1853, we had the creation of a central educational council among Ottoman Armenians. And finally, the ratification of the final draft of the constitution itself in 1863. So with the opening, so with the um, kind of, um, ratification of this constitution, we see the creation of a new political body called the Na National Assembly, as time and Tanu Hayot, with legislative powers and the two councils, religious and civic, with executive power. So this is a very brief overview of this constitutional phase. Sorry, I don't have an English translation of this, of this chart, but it's, it's a kind of a rough um, overview of what this communal bureaucratic system looked like. You have the patriarch, the national assembly, the, the executive kind of administration with the civic council, 
religious council and the subcommittees and the commissions. So in theory, when you read the text of the constitution, you realize that it was drafted to actually neutralize different ecclesiastical centers or religious power centers that were in the empire and to try to centralize all the power within the Armenian Patriarchate of Constantinople. So if we look at the map here, we see four or five different ecclesiastical centers with the Armenian Constantinople, with the Armenian Patriarchate of Istanbul here, the Catholic Crusades of uh, Giligia in Sis, of Ahtamar in Van, the Patriarchate of Jerusalem, and the Armenian Ecclesiastical Center in Echmiadi. So in theory, the constitution was supposed to neutralize these rival ecclesiastical centers, religious centers, and centralize the power in the hands of the Armenian Patriarchate of Constantinople. So this is really in theory, and we know this much from the existing historiography literature. So what next? This is the, the question that comes to my mind when I think about these larger issues. So we need to distinguish between theory and practice. And I suggest actually looking at this constitution, the Armenian constitution, not only as a legal text, but also as a sociological object that was formed by inner societal forces and was explicable through an analysis of these broad, broad or uh, broad patterns of social formation. So in a way, we should actually situate the constitution within the social currents, within the social formation patterns that we see among Ottoman Armenians in this, in this period. And this is exactly what I'll try to do in the next few slides. So in my, in, in my dissertation, I argued that the 1863 constitution was a turning point for the Ottoman Armenian community in so far as it kind of marked the emergence of what I refer to as the constitutional order. So by constitutional order, I mean an, a communal frame that regulated and controlled the behavior, expectations, actions, and daily lives of Ottoman Armenians. So after 1863, we see Armenian political and social actions within this general framework of constitutionalism. And as a result, we see the proliferation of new social and political terminologies that we read in the newspapers, in the periodicals at the time, such as the rule of law, justice, legality, legitimacy. So all these concepts are being discussed and debated heatedly in the newspapers of, and the periodicals of, of the time. For the constitutionalists in Constantinople at the time, having a constitution for their community was also, as I said in the beginning, a marker of progress, loyalty, and more, most importantly, legitimacy. Legitimacy and loyalty to the Ottoman state or within the Ottoman state. So what we can really conclude from this slide is that after 1863, the constitution really set the new rules of the game within the Ottoman Armenian community at large. So as a result, Ottoman Armenians start, started addressing local, communal, and imperial issues by using this constitutional framework, by using the constitutional tools, mechanism, and institutions that were created at the time. So for those of you who are familiar with late Ottoman history, we know that in the Tanzimat period in the 19th century, there was a shift uh, from the imperial palace where the Sultan actually resided and which was the center of Ottoman power for almost 400 years to the sublime port to let's say the bureaucracy to the administration where these new Tanzimat statesmen and uh, elites were based. So I argue in the dissertation that a seminal shift or a parallel shift, a mirroring shift occurred among the Armenians as well after this constitution because the National Assembly became the new locus of power in the community. So we see a shift from the patriarch or the person of the patriarch to the National Assembly in the way we see a shift from the Imperial Palace to the Sublime Port or the Tanzimat institutions. 
So these are just some examples of the new mechanisms and institutions of control, auditing, and accountability that were created after 1863 to regulate, let's say, inheritance issues, wills, uh, min minutes, uh, and um, uh, reports of the civic council, the subcommittees. So all these are new mechanisms of control that we see emerging in the community. All right. So one of the questions that actually comes to my mind was or is, who are these constitutionalists? So who are the men of the constitution? The constitution? So with the professionalization of the patriarchate after 1863 and the opening of the National Assembly, as I said, we see the projection of the Istanbul-based Armenian elite to the forefront of communal politics. So this means that many Armenian bureaucrats in the imperial administration who were working for the Ottoman state, mostly in the Sublime Port and the Ministry of Foreign Affairs are now becoming new communal deputies or what was referred to or called at the time as Kainir So these, these elites, these Istanbul-based elites are really becoming the new leaders uh, legitimate leaders of, of the community after 1863. And if we read their reports, the minutes of the National Assembly, the, 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 the debates in the newspapers at the time, we get a sense that constitutionalists placed education, rationality, progress, and the rule of law at the core of their reform agenda. And it's not really a coincidence that it was only after 1863 that we see a major campaign of quote unquote civilizing and enlightening uh, provincial Armenians who were seen as backwards, who were seen as, as not civilized enough. And it's not a coincidence that we see a proliferation of uh, philanthropic associations, educational organizations, weekend lectures, literacy and reading campaigns. So all these are actually um, a result of this constitutional movement that we see uh, in the 1860s. So some examples of pioneers of constitutionalism among the Armenians, Krikorodian, some of you may have heard of him or know, of him, Stepan Aslanian, Artim, Artim Dadian, Gabriel Noradingian. So all these people are Istanbul-based um, Ottoman statesmen in a way, Ottoman elites, who became the new communal leaders of this new constitutional system. It's also important to have an understanding of how this constitutional system worked in Istanbul. So basically what I call the tools of constitutional governance. And we focus here on the church committees or what is referred to in Armenian as the Tagan Khurut, which became the smallest constitutional bodies in the community and furnished the foundations of this new system by becoming the regulators of neighborhood affairs, organizers of local elections, and monitors of neighborhood schools. I will talk more in detail about each one of these points in a minute. So on the right side, you see a map of uh, Istanbul where the Armenian churches are located. So each one of these church committees were assigned to a specific church. And in that specific neighborhood, they became the regulators of communal life. So how did these church committees operate. As I said, they became these small power centers in each neighborhood that regulated the affairs of the local community. So Armenians residing in those specific neighborhoods addressed specific issues uh, such as land transactions, structural problems, inter or intra-communal tensions, disputes over estates or spaces, requests for material relief, or reported on constitutional application and violation. These were all the functions that these church committees actually assumed. And one of the, I guess, important and even fascinating points that needs further research is that these church committees became the regulators of quote unquote public and communal morality. So they were very careful not to allow uh, illegal marriages, illegal divorces, conversions among the Armenians 
So they, they, they functioned as these moral police among the, uh, among the Ottoman Armenians to secure kind of the status quo of the community as such. These are some examples of uh, minutes or reports from different church committees in Istanbul. And these documents are now housed in the Nubayan Library in Paris. So one of the major questions that I try to tackle in the dissertation when I kind of shift the focus from Istanbul to the provinces where the majority of the Armenians actually live was, was there such a thing as provincial constitutionalism? Did it really work in the case of the provinces? So what I, what I, I would say is the implementation of the constitution itself became a problem from the, from the outset. And in order to uh, illustrate some of the points that I will make in the next few slides, I will focus on the province of Sepastia or Sivas as a site or as a microcosm of early constitutional struggles. So what we can see from the case of, of Sepastia was that it became this quote unquote rehearsal ground for other provinces, meaning that some of the problems that the patriarchate witnessed or experienced in, in, in Sepastia set a precedent for the patriarchate to actually uh, come up with better strategies and um, solutions for other provinces experiencing similar constitutional problem. So when we look at the case of Sebastia, we see in 1863 and 1864 orders coming from the patriarchate about local elections, elections for a provincial, let's say, assembly, provincial institutions, provincial constitutional institutions to be more exact. So we, we see that there was a committee that was called the Committee for the Implementation of the Constitution in Armenian Korza Tirhan Snazhorov Askan Sama Tuchan that was to be the body that regulated these constitutional operations in larger Sebastia. So for those of you who don't have a kind of, who don't really visualize the geography, this is where the province of Sepastia is or was at the time. And to zoom in on the province itself, it was divided to four major subdistricts, with the center being Sepastia right here. This is a very interesting report from the city of Tokat, which was another major center in the province of Sebastia, dated December 1863. It was, it was a report that was drafted by, the, by this committee for the implementation of the constitution, and it reports on the number of male taxpayers registered for each church in each district. Uh, we have to bear in mind that this constitutional system was, was a, a male-centered, a male-dominated system. So it was only male taxpayers uh, who had the right to be elected into the National Assembly or to any of the constitutional institutions of the Patriarchate. And this is just a reflection of that. So the effort of the Armenian Patriarchate to export this constitutional system from Constantinople to the provinces, as I said, created strong backlash in the community, in the community of Sepastia, and it divided the community into different, oftentimes rivaling factions. So if we look at the society, the Armenian society of Sepastia at the time, we see major Armenian households or notable households, around 15 Armenian households, who really dominated the communal affairs in the town. So these notables in the sources are referred to in Armenian as Yerebeliner, Ishkhaner, Kojabashaner, Chorbajaner, Mahdesiner, Aghaner. So these are all different categories of notables that we see in the sources. So what these notables realized that they could actually better um, preserve their interests against the patriarchate by forming a coalition with each other. So after 1863, we see this consolidation of what I call the provincial alliance between the secular households, these notable households, and the senior clergymen of the town being the prelate, the Arachnort of Sepastia, and the other senior bishops or archbishops of the town. So this provincial alliance really became 
the force in the city that mobilized its social networks to remain in power. So they mobilized their access to Ottoman, to Ottoman local officials, to Armenian schools, Armenian seasonal workers and migrants. Uh, so all this created a social capital and even a political capital that these notables could leverage on to remain in power. And what is really interesting, I guess, in this case, which is not really covered in the historiography as much as I could actually decipher, was these notables were not really opposing the constitution as a document, the constitution as a system. When we look at their reports, at their publications, at their uh, personal papers, personal archives, we see that they relied and used the language of the constitutionalism, of constitutionalism, to actually counter the strategies and the uh, policies of the patriarchate itself. So they, they were using the game of the patriarchate to counter what the patriarchate was trying to do, basically centralize the power in the patriarchate. So this means that they were okay with reform, they were okay with the idea of constitutional rule or reform, as long as it was on their own terms. This is a very important point that will have uh, consequences for the later decades. To actually illustrate this point, uh, I'm showing a, a petition that was signed by many Armenians of Sepastia and the notables of Sepastia addressing to the patriarchate. And I've translated an excerpt from it. And I'm sorry, it's a little, it's a little long, but I'm quoting from the, uh, from the uh, petition here. Quote, therefore, we consider it our current duty to declare to the respectable assembly that the people demand the complete implementation of the constitution. And if there is any obstacle or difficulty in its implementation, again, it is solely the national assembly that can see that obstacle or difficulty and accordingly order the civic council to do the same. Any measure beyond this legal or legitimate process is unacceptable and the patriarch, the deputies, and the communal administration are obliged to follow this. We ask from your respectable assembly to consider this declaration and to have the wisdom of keeping the community free from anarchism by removing all the obstacles against the implementation of the constitution to promote the true welfare and progress of the nation. Deputy ministers or effendis, the nation expects nothing of you but the constitution and its implementation, unquote, 8 August, 1873. So as you can see, they were very active in using the language of the constitution to actually address their local problems, to make claims to communal politics, and to actually um, limit what the patriarchate could do in the province of Sebastia itself. This is a list of the local power brokers, Armenian power brokers in the city of Sepasta, it's a partial list of these notable households who formed what I call this provincial alliance or coalition. It's a partial list. I've, I've mentioned nine or 10. It should be around 15 or 16 major households. So these people were either landowners, usurers, or vashkarus in Armenian tax farmers, merchants, and suppliers to Ottoman offices and armies. So these were kind of affluent or wealthy households who tried to maintain their grip over communal politics, over communal affairs. So with the, with the creation of this constitutional system, these notables were kind of flexible enough to use these mechanisms the language of the, of the constitution to legitimize their rule and their leadership over communal affairs. So they acted as official intermediaries between the community and the Ottoman uh, authorities, Ottoman imperial authorities. So through their access to wealth, local Ottoman officials, monastical orders, philanthropic associations, and migrant workers networks, they successfully integrated themselves into this new constitutional system. And as I said, through a coalition of different notable households and the major 
senior clergymen in the town, such as the Archbishop Garabet which, uh, and Archbishop uh, Bedros Tamiz, Tamizjan, which I will show in a minute, they, these notables obstructed any external and internal challengers from defying their role as political communal leaders. And this is a, this is a major system that we see emerging after the eight, uh, 1860s constitutional, let's say, debates. So what this means for these notable households was that as long as they maintained a communal status quo, as long as they acted as communal leaders, they received imperial privileges from the Ottoman imperial authorities. And for the Ottoman state, this was a convenient, let's say, modus operandi or a modus vivendi, because it delegated uh, the or it outsourced the uh, the the policing of the community to these Ottoman uh, to these Ottoman Armenian households and kept a status quo within the community itself. So this is a picture of Bedros Tamizjan. the Archbishop Pedros Tahmizjan, who was one of the main power brokers in Sepastia until his death in 1907. And he was a major ally of these, of these uh, notable households that you just saw in, in the list. This is an interesting petition, just to kind of visualize what I was just telling, a, a petition written by more than 150 Sepastatsis in Istanbul protesting against a certain person, Antanik Bartanyan, who has tarnished the reputation of Sepastia and its prelate. So they asked that Antanik be summoned to Istanbul for a trial in the presence of the Patriarchate and the Mixed Council. Another example of the petition in support of Archbishop Garabet to return to Sepastia as the official Arash North, as the official prelate of the town. So these two petitions are just some examples of how notable, how these Ottoman Armenian notable households mobilized their networks in Istanbul as well as in Sepastia to actually make a claim to communal and imperial politics. So they relied on this, on this um, constitutional system. They relied on the constitutional language to make, to make a case for the return of their quote unquote beloved Archbishop Garabet to Sepastia. So the concepts or themes such as the rule of law, the will of the people, uh, popular representation are, are actually prolific in these, in these petitions. And we see how these people were very active in, in utilizing and adapting to these new concepts. So what, what, how, how does the patriarchate respond or react to these, let's say, uh, opposition strategies? So in the 1860s and 1870s, we had many official inspectors coming from Constantinople sent by the Patriarchate itself to Sepastia to actually investigate constitutional violations or constitutional, uh, let's say, uh, uh, practices. However, the Patriarchate quickly realizes that if, if it did not have the support of the notables, it could not make any reform in the city itself. So the Patriarchate realizes, or the National Assembly realizes this in the early 18th. 70s, and it realizes that it was too weak to break the power of these provincial alliances. So in a way, the patriarchate had to compromise and it needed to accommodate these local notables. And that's why from 1873 until 1885, we can describe this period as the most effective constitutional governance among Ottoman Armenians, when all the institutions and the mechanisms of reporting, auditing, accountability have uh, function with much more efficiency and much more, uh, let's say, much more power. Next, I'll turn in the dissertation to what I refer as the crisis or the collapse of this constitutional order. And I'll try to go into the reasons, uh, into the causes of this collapse briefly. So this is a time period from 1888 until 1908, when this constitutional system that was really working for almost three decades 
for the Ottoman Armenians started actually collapsing or was in full paralysis or crisis in the early 20th century. And one of the major reasons for this was we have a change in the Ottoman Sultan. Sultan Abdul Hamid II becomes the Ottoman Sultan in 1876. So we have a radical shift in domestic policies and a reconfiguration of communal politics, which I will explicate in a minute. So to give a brief overview, overview of what the Hamidian regime actually looked like, when Abdul Hamid became the Sultan, he, uh, one of the first things that he did was he abrogated the Ottoman parliament, which was created in 1876 as well, but lasted until 1878. So there was no Ottoman parliament after that. He implemented new measures of Islamic Sunni orthopraxy and tried to dismantle the institutions that the Tanzimat reforms had created. So with these Tanzimat institutions, Armenians had received some form of let's say, rep uh, representational power in Ottoman politics. So when Abdul Hamid dismantled these institutions, he really deprived the Armenians the means to politically be represented in Ottoman, let's say, um, um, bureaucracy in Ottoman political institutions. Furthermore, he empowered the Kurdish tribal militias in Eastern Anatolia and empowered local Muslim elites, oftentimes at the expense of local Armenians. So we see a more assertive and a repressive central state with Abdul Hamid being the Sultan that exacerbated the socioeconomic situation of the Armenians, mostly in the Eastern provinces. And we all know from let's say conventional Armenian historiography that it was against this background that we see the formation of Armenian revolutionary parties, three Armenian revolutionary parties, the Dashnak Sushun, the, the, the Hanchakyan party and the Armenagans. What I, what I would like to do today is not to go into the history of these parties or what these parties uh, stood for, but I'll try to explicate how these parties also contributed to the collapse of this constitutional system, to this collapse of this constitutional order. So in the final chapters of my dissertation, I talk about the creation of these radical or revolutionary parties as a new avenues for political mobilization for many disenfranchised Ottoman Armenians. So the continuous hold of these provincial notables over the constitutional institutions pushed many of these marginalized, poor, or coming from socially, uh, let's say, uh, disenfranchised classes to look for new avenues of political mobilization. And when these revolutionary party, parties started operating within Ottoman domains, they created a set of new institutions that I refer to as the radical order. So we had the constitutional order, now we see the, the creation and an emergence of a new uh, set of institutions such as revolutionary taxes and tribunals, clandestine committees, mobile armed bands, weapon smuggling networks. So these were new let's say in a way radical institutions that these revolutionary parties were creating and trying to actually set up a new communal administration. And the reason, one of the reasons why these revolutionaries were successful to some extent was that they operated outside the contours of this constitutional order. So throughout the 1860s, 70s, 80s, the reason why many challengers to the notables failed was because they were using the same constitutional mechanisms and the tools that the notables already controlled. So they had no chance against the notables by relying on the same rules of the game. So what the revolutionaries did was they tried to operate outside or, uh, the, uh, the parameters of this constitutional system. So for these revolutionaries, the constitutional order was not really a solution, but part of the problem that really uh, contributed to the worsening of the socioeconomic conditions of the Armenians. So remember, for the, uh, for the constitutionalists in the 1860s, reform was equal with constitutional rule. They saw constitutional system as derivative, as uh, conducive to reform and enlightenment in the community. However, 
for these revolutionaries coming from poorer social classes, these notables who controlled the constitutional system were in themselves part of the problem. So if you look through or skim through the periodicals or the publications of the revolutionaries, whether they are the, uh, the, the Armenian Revolutionary Federation or the Hanchakians, we see a strong anti-constitutional rhetoric in, uh, a, and a strong anti-constitutional discourse in their newspapers. So the revolutionaries elaborated new conceptions of justice, national service, communal, communal belonging, and political rights that were completely different from the way these notables had understood communal leadership in the 1860s, 70s, and 80s. So for them, the constitutionalists were not really, really reformists, but communal liabilities who should be removed or who should be neutralized by all costs. So we see these reformers, quote unquote reformers, two decades ago, turning or transformed into repressive collaborators or even national traders. And it's not really surprising that we have revolutionaries assassinating communal leaders such as the patriarch or trying to assassinate him, uh, attacking the chairman of the national assembly or attacking other constitutional officials at the time. And this is one of my favorite caricatures that was published in the satirical journal uh, of the Hanchakyan party called Aptak in, uh, in the May 1894 issue. And as you can see, it's titled as Herapuchan Avela, the broom of the revolution. So we see a major, uh, an Armenian peasant, uh, judging from his attire, his, his clothing, actually sweeping the, the floor from the patriarch the, and other Tanzimat elites or communal elites, uh, the tax farmers or uh, loan sharks. And we see a kind of uh, the dawn of a new beginning on the Armenian peasants. So this really captures the mindset of I would say revolutionary elites, maybe not revolutionary um, average militants on the ground, but most of the revolutionary elites at the time. So, so remember these people, these constitutionalist pioneers of the 1860s. So we, we basically go from this in the 1860s to this in the 1890s and the early, 18, uh, early 1900s. This is pretty much what communal politics started to look like in the 1890s and early 1900s. So in this final slide, before I conclude, we should also talk about how the Ottoman authority, authorities reacted to these, let's say, developments to these changes among the Ottoman Armenian community. So Armenian revolutionaries, as I said, with their actions, with their assassinations, with their, uh, with their attacks, this destabilized the communal status quo. So in, 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 uh, in many ways, they jeopardized the communal leadership of these provincial notables because these, uh, these communal leaders were not in a position to stop the revolutionaries, to curb their activities. So once the revolutionaries started creating new nodes of power that bypassed constitutional and imperial institutions, they directly threatened the constitutional system that was put in place in the 1860s. So this means that uh, they undermined the existing modus operandi between the communal leaders, uh, these constitutionalist elites, notables, and the Ottoman authorities. So basically what the Ottoman authorities said was, if you cannot maintain the communal status quo, you don't receive any privileges or any benefits. So as a result, the Ottoman authorities started more aggressively intervening in communal affairs. They were very anxious that these revolutionaries would use the mechanisms of the constitutional system to infiltrate into the constitutional bodies and uh, actually um, create more headache for the Ottoman state. So as a result, for every outbreak of violence and commotion in the community, the Ottoman authorities, central authorities, ascribed collective responsibility to provincial prelates and notables, as well as the patriarchy. So this aggressive intervention and the frantic effort to preserve 
uh, a communal status quo put this constitutional order under extreme pressure from above as well as from below. From below because the revolutionaries were targeting this system from above because the Ottoman uh, authorities were trying very hard to maintain the status quo and pressuring the Ottoman Armenian communal leaders to actually do their job and maintain the communal status quo. And this actually led to, a, 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 let's say, a paralysis of the constitutional order and opened the way for the Ottoman authorities to, uh, to intervene much more aggressively and even brutally in Ottoman Armenian communal life. So we see many uh, violations of constitutional practices, dismissal of patriarchal appointees, the, uh, exiling prelates and bishops at the discretion of the Ottoman imperial authorities without even consulting the patriarchate. So these, these, these practices really violated the constitutional system that was put in place in the 1860s. So finally, when we come to the 1890s, before we conclude, we should say that the constitutional order, at least for, for the regime that Abdul Hamid had created, became a liability. So we have many reports actually sent by the Sultan to the different ministries in the Ottoman system, questioning the legality of the National Assembly. So the Sultan is asking whether this National Assembly has any legitimacy, whether it, it's legal or not. So the, these, these reports in a way show the anxieties of the Ottoman state at the time and how they were trying to find a way to, uh, to neutralize this constitutional system and make it much more simple, uh, the interaction between the Ottoman state and the Armenian communal elites. So finally, after the massacres of 1894, 1896, we have an abrogation of the Armenian constitution and a ban on the National Assembly. So the National Assembly meets for the last time in uh, the late summer, early autumn of 1896, and it's banned after that until 1908. So basically to visualize what I just said, from 1860 until 1896, the Sultan was interacting with the Patriarch through the, uh, through the mechanisms of the National Assembly and the Civic Council. However, after 1896 until 1908, we don't have the National Assembly. The Sultan is directly interacting with the Patriarch Malakia Ormanian, who became the new Patriarch in 1896 and continued to rule until the Young Turk Revolution of 1908. So some concluding remarks and I'll be done. So what we can really conclude from the few points I made throughout this presentation is that constitutionalism was not merely an intellectual current in the 1860s that stopped after 1878 with the closure of the Ottoman parliament. Uh, at least for the Armenian case, it remained a fervent and a vibrant political culture and a social experience that furnished in many ways the, mod the, found the modern foundations of the Armenian nation uh, that continued later in the diaspora. It was far from being an Ottoman, quote unquote, Ottoman favor. So the Ottoman statesmen were not doing a favor to the Armenians by granting them a, a, a constitution because Ottoman officials soon realized that dealing with the secular elites was much uh, harder than handling the obscurantist or the backwards religious classes. So starting the 1890s, as I said, we, have, we see two concurrent co communitarian systems among the Ottoman Armenians, a declining constitutional order and a more militarizing radical order that continued until 1908. And finally, the Hamidian regime significantly reconfigured Ottoman Armenian politics by uh, banning the National Assembly. So what, what occurred was, as with the Hamidian regime, the center of power came back to the imperial palace from the sublime port. For the Armenians as well, the, the locus of power actually shifted from the National Assembly 
back to the person of the patriarch. So we go from an institutional mediation between the state and society to an individual mediation under Abdul Hamid, at least between 1896 and 1908. So it was only after 1908 when the Young Turks came to power that the radical and the constitutional orders were synchronized into a, a new communitarian system that survived uh, well beyond the destruction of the empire uh, during World War One. Thank you. Thank you, Varak, for this fascinating uh, presentation. I'd like to open the floor for questions. You can ask questions uh, just uh, audio using your audio, or uh, you can write in the chat section. Please go ahead. Okay, I'll start the question uh, series, Varak. Uh, is there a possibility to think an in-between, an in-between uh, solution to this issue that it's not clear-cut constitutional order versus radical order? It could be that in certain geographic areas, this both were able to coexist together at the same time, depending on the geography. Uh, well, at least in the early 1890s, when these revolutionaries had just started to create their own institutions and systems, we do have a concurrent constitutional and radical order. That continues until the 1896 massacres and the change in the, in the person of the patriarch. But after 1896, I'm really hesitant to talk about a functioning constitutional system because it's, it's um, clearly in decline. So the National Assembly is not meeting, the patriarch himself, Makia Urmanian, is involved in a lot of, let's say, endeavors to find relief and, su and support for the Armenians after the massacres, after 1896 massacres. So it's really in the person of Malakia Urmanian that the power is centralized. And, and uh, the Ottoman authorities are really happy with this. That's one. Second, the 1890s massacres actually undermined the social and economic power of these notables as well. Not only were they targets of assassinations by the revolutionaries, but the massacres in which the local Muslim population was also involved uh, really undermined their power. So once they don't have the, the, the means with which they were controlling the community, they started actually losing their privileges. And as a result, they started to lose their grip over communal affairs. And that's another reason why I'm saying the constitutional system was in decline. Of course, these institutions did not disappear all of a sudden. We still see church committees functioning in one way or another, or provincial assemblies meeting in probably once every few years, but as a functioning system, as a system that Armenians used to mediate their communal, local, regional problems, it's not really a viable alternative. This doesn't mean that all the Armenians who lost the, this access went to the revolutionaries. No, the, I'm not really suggesting that the revolutionaries mobilized all the Armenians. Of course, there were many people who opposed the revolutionaries and the revolutionaries really uh, stayed a minority among the Ottoman Armenians in terms of demographic minority. But they were influential enough to actually oblige many local notables to either cooperate with them, collaborate with them, or even infiltrate their system and dictate what they should do or they should not do. All right, thank you, Varak. Uh, we have a question from Manuk Abedikian. Does your research also look at generational shifts within pro-reformer notable families who later joined the radical order? Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Thank you, Armen, uh, for, for the question. Maybe I just, uh, Manok, not Armen. Uh, maybe I just need to, I just need you to uh, kind of clarify what you mean by uh, not all families. Um, just to add, um, thank you for the, th thank you for your presentation. I, I'm being made, like basically after the Russo-Turkish War, it seems to me that there was, there were notables that were pro pro Tanzimat. Of course, that the Tanzimat reforms, you know, were you know no longer after Abdul Hamid kind of kind of destroyed them. Um, but it seems to me that there were movements in Erzurum or in Van, where there were where there were notable families that were pro constitutionalism. But of course, now being now being abandoned by the state, many of them joined the revolutionary movement or different manifest or like early manifestations of it within Ottoman Armenia or like within the Ottoman Armenian context. And then later with with the with the Hunchaks and Tashnaks. So I mean like yeah, that's, a, that's a that's a that's a good question. That's a question that I try to think about. Well right after the Russo-Turkish War of 1877-78, it's still very early to talk about the notables abandoning the constitutional system. As I said, it was only in the early to mid 1890s that some notables tried to join the revolutionaries. So we don't really know whether they joined the revolutionaries out of fear, out of intimidation, or out of, let's say, ideological sympathies. We do have some cases, for example, the case of the Terzibashans in Van, where, let's say, the, the older Terzibashans were part of this notable system. However, um, Avedis Terzibashan, if I'm not mistaken, is sympathetic, at least in his in his writings, to the to the revolutionaries. That's one. Second, some of the notables, again, in the case of Van, which I've looked more closely, uh, turned to revolutionaries not because of ideological sympathies as such, but they were the more, let's say, marginalized notable class among these inter or intra notable rivalries and tensions. So for those of you who are familiar with the history in Van, there were two factions, the Borossians and the, the Aborossians, the anti-Borossians. So it was only the some people from the anti-Borossian faction that eventually sympathized with some revolutionaries. So there is this generational aspect, but I'm very, reluctant to generalize it and say it that the 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 sons of these notables all joined the revolutionary movement. Uh, we have another question from Professor Ohanian uh, Barak. This is great. Thank you. What are the implications from your work for the Ottoman imperial state governance? Also, where uh, also where there's were there similar constitution orders at the same time emerging in other millets? Uh, thank you, Professor Anyan, for the question. Uh, as far as I know, the, the Greeks and the Jews also received their communal constitutions, but we don't see any such vibrancy or any such political culture develop among uh, the Jews, uh, nor among, among the Greeks. I guess for the Jews, because of their geographic restriction to Istanbul, and uh, to uh, and for the case of the Greeks, although the Greeks kind of had a similar constitution, but the power of of the ecclesiastical and the religious classes, which was much more than the lay classes. And once um, once the the Greek independent state was formed in the early nineteenth century, I guess the center of power also shifted to the, the to the Greek kingdom. And many of the Greek notable families actually lost their privileges and power among the um, um, Ottoman authorities. So that's 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 the second uh, kind of section of the question. The first one: What is what are the implications from your work for the Ottoman imperial state governance? I guess one way of of answering this question is to understand how in the 1890s and the early 1900s, the, uh, the Armenian 
constitutional experience really became a headache for the Ottoman state. So we, so with this, with this dissertation, what I'm trying to actually argue is when we look at Ottoman uh, kind of practices of, of violence, of repression, of intimidation and securitization of the state, the Armenian experience, the Armenian constitutional experience is a fundamental component, of, a fundamental component of that. That's one. Second, um, I don't really go into the details of the massacres as such, but one way of interpreting these massacres is that they, um, they, they, um, they devastated or undermined the constitutional foundations of the system. So most of the scholarship on, on these massacres focus on the violence, on the killings, on the perpetrators, but as, a, as, as, an imperial, as an imperial governance or as a system of governance, it was also a, a devastating blow to Armenian constitutional foundations. And it was only after that that we see the radical order becoming much more militarized than it was in the early 1890s because these constitutional checks and balances that had kept the community uh, together in one way or another is really, um, is really gone after the massacres. The, the people who, who staffed these institutions are either killed or exiled or, or are really uh, economically and socially devastated that they lose all their privileges within the community. And it's not really a coincidence that after 1908, it's mostly these former militants and revolutionaries that become these new uh, communal leaders. So for example, um, Baham Papazian Gomes uh, or um, what's his name? Uh, Armen Garo uh, become these new Ottoman uh, deputies in the parliament. This is not, this was really un, um, unimaginable in the 1860s, 1870s, people with humble backgrounds such as uh, Vahan or Armengaro uh, or even other deputies in the parliament who represented the, the Dashnaktsutrum in the Ottoman parliament uh, attained such a role in Ottoman politics. So this is really what the Hamidian regime or this is how really the Hamidian regime reconfigured Armenian politics in the 1890s and the early 1900s. Does that uh, answer the question, Anna? All right, let's 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 move to uh, to uh, Nathan Bedrosian, and then we have another question by Dr. Panosian, and that's it, we have to leave. Uh, was there also clashes between reformists and conservatives in Smyrna and Trace regions starting since 1860s? Was there any active revolution movement in mentioned areas? Uh, was there any active revolutionary movement in the mentioned areas? Yes, uh, at least the the Armenian Revolutionary Federation was active in Izmir. We do have a lot of archives and um, reports from the Izmir committees, uh, but I'm not sure I understood fully uh, the, the clashes between reformists and conservatives in Smyria and Trace. I mean, there were the, the these were the constitutional movement, the Khavar Yalner and the Rusapan Yalner, you know? I think oh, okay. that refers to the constitution the, the conservatives, not the not, not the revolutionary period. I'm, yeah, I think he's talking about. Uh, I guess the reformists and the conservatives are really broad categories that don't really say much about about these people. For example, most of the constitutionalists were the the sons or the descendants of of people who sure. were categorized as conservatives only a decade ago. So in the 1840s, 1850s, the, the pioneers of constitution, constitution, constitutionalism who were educated in Europe were the sons of these conservatives. So I would suggest not actually being uh, guided by these two very ossified concepts of reformists versus conservatives, because if we, if we keep up with these categories, we actually fall in the trap of what I just said about the notables. The notables in the literature, they are discussed as these conservatives, as opponents of reform. Even in the literature that is written by Armenian parties, 
these notables are represented as either national traders, as collaborators, as opponents of change. But as I just tried to, to explain in, in the slides, they, they understood change in a very specific way in their very own terms. And that's what is important. So the Amiras, for example, in, in Constantinople, we were not really conservatives in the very strict sense of the term. They did adapt to some of the changes, but they adapted to these changes with very specific rules of the game, rules that they had set down. Uh, so I guess that's how I would respond to that question. Okay, last question by Dr. Panosian, please. Uh, thank you, Varak. Uh, very fascinating uh, lecture and a welcome break for me from daily meetings and uh, emails. And thank you to the uh, Society for Armenian Studies for engaging on this uh, new initiative. I think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, my question has to do with um, uh, circulation or the link uh, among the constitutionalists. Uh, between the Russian Empire and, uh, and the Ottoman Empire. Uh, we know in, the, in Russian Armenia, the situation was completely different. Uh, we know that the revolutionaries, 1880s, 1890s onwards, were fluid and circulating between Russian Empire and the uh, Ottoman Empire. But in the case of the constitutionalists, were there links uh, between the two, uh, like the two Armenias, let's say, between uh, the Ottoman and the Russian sort of liberal bourgeois elite. Uh, uh, have you found any kind of connection, any kind of circulation uh, of either men or ideas? I guess if we if we'll start with the ideas in the 1830s, the Russian authorities created this constitution, this ecclesiastical constitution for Echmiad in what is called the Volozhenia, and that was a model for some of the constitutionalists in, in Istanbul for the Ottoman Armenian case. But of course, they wanted, to, um, they wanted to distinguish it or differentiate it from the Bologenia because that was a constitution that really had an ecclesiastical nature. And it was a constitution that really put Echmiadzin under uh, further, let's say, control of the Russian imperial authorities. That's not something that the Ottoman Armenian constitutions wanted to do. They wanted to check the powers of, of, the, um, of the patriarchate, but at the same time, they wanted to be involved or be partners of the Tanzimat project of the Ottoman authorities. So the kind of the, the, the raison d'etre for these two regulations are, are very different to begin with. As for men, the, the, the circulation among the revolutionaries, which was much more, I guess, in, in, in ways that I've, saw, that I've seen than between constitutions between the Russian uh, liberal bourgeoisie and the, let's say, the Odian types in, in, in Istanbul. Of course, there were some visits by, um, by, by Nalbandian uh, and, uh, and translations or republications of Kamar Katiba and uh, other kind of liberal intellectuals at the time. But I would say that's, that's, all, that's, that's all for what I've seen. Thank you. We can't hear you, Bedros. Thank you very much, everyone, for attending this, uh, this talk. Uh, if you are a graduate student and interested in presenting your talk, please contact Varak uh, Ketsemanian and uh, Katarina Terzian, who will uh, prepare uh, the, uh, the Zoom uh, talk. And uh, thank you for attending. Just a quick announcement on, uh, on just a second. On June the 2nd, uh, Dr. Pamela Stein, Pamela Steiner is going to talk about her uh, latest book, Collective Trauma and the Armenian Genocide, Armenian, Turkish, and Azerbaijani Relations Since 1839. Uh, the talk is co -sponsor, sponsored by the Society of Armenian Studies and uh, the Nas National Association for Armenian Studies and Research. I hope you can attend. It's June the 2nd, 
uh, 4.30 Pacific time and 7.30 Eastern time. So uh, looking forward to seeing you there. And if you have any questions, please uh, contact me. One SMS. more quick, quick, um, quick note for the graduate student colloquium. The format is really flexible. You can uh, potential uh, contributors or presenters can choose their the timing that fits their schedule. They can choose to have a discussion or moderator at their own discretion. So we're really flexible in accommodating these these graduate students or early career scholars. Thank you very much. Uh, have a great day, everyone. Thank you so much, Pedros. Thank you, Pedros. Bye.